I can remember the first time I went to the marsh and, and saw it and felt it and watched the ducks and the geese. and. Man, waterfowl hunting is probably the funnest kind of hunting. Just seeing birds work and all the sounds they make, it's awesome. They would be twisting and turning. You know, I've always enjoyed the drama of decoying ducks and geese and having them over the spread. But cranes specifically, I mean, there's really nothing like it. You got like a 747 coming from the heavens. If you get somebody in the woods or the marsh, they are hooked for life. You know, a lot of people have asked me all the time, why? Why do I love duck hunting more than I love the others? And for me, it's, a, it's like the dance. You're calling to try and see if they'll come dance with you. We're a bunch of determined individuals and we push for wetland conservation. It's just, it is our passion. Well done! Right! To see them cut, dip, and weave. Let's go! <laughs> It was like the epitome of puddle of honey. To watch the birds work is the real objective of the hunt. Ducks Unlimited Television is presented by Drake Waterfowl Systems, innovators in waterfowl hunting. Welcome to another fast-paced installment of Ducks Unlimited TV. I'm Betsy Nable. In this episode, we head west to New Mexico with DUTV co-host Doug Larson, joining top state volunteers. Then, Doug travels to the Great Salt Lake in Utah, where he joins DU staff and supporters at the Chesapeake Club, one of the oldest duck hunting clubs in America. We'll also learn about the challenges facing Western Region DU volunteers in a place known more for cowboys and horses than ducks and geese. Right now, on DUTV. I'm sure that if you're an elk hunter, if you're a bow hunter, if you're a big game hunter, you know all about New Mexico. It's a pretty popular big game destination, but I think waterfowl is pretty far down the list. Not a lot of folks know about it. This state is important to waterfowl because it is a flyover state where we have this habitat where ducks are uh, not necessarily wintering here for the full winter, but they're staging here. I think the most interesting thing when you hunt the desert is the sort of a strange mix of species. You see the white geese, of course. I think the cranes, are a fascinating bird. You know, they're not really waterfowl per se. I think they're probably more closely related to the coot. Typically, we run A-frames on the side of the field with an edge hide and tumbleweeds. The great thing about this part of the world is, is tumbleweed. It's light, it's easy to pull. If you don't have the, the right hide, if your blind isn't brushed extremely well, they're gonna flare. You know, they're a bird that are coming in from the perspective of a goose up high, but they've got vision like a turkey. When they do it, it's the best thing ever because they're so goofy whenever they flip out of the air and maple leaf. It's wild. It's fun to watch. And it was a blast. I fell in love with the way uh, that the bird is and the success story of restoring this species in the United States is, is truly special. It's not just you know, getting out there and getting in a blind and, and getting your birds killed. It's to be able to, to get out there and understand what you're doing, understand where those cranes fit in the landscape, you know, understand what makes those birds tick. I learned so much in a couple of days, you know, hunting these cranes. They're like geese, but they're bigger. They do different things than geese. They don't come off a roost and go straight into a field. And uh, Matt and Caleb Brewer, they're very committed. They've got a really nice network of land. They've got great equipment, they know what they're doing, and uh, feet down outfitters out of Roswell, and uh, I was very impressed. They're the hardest bird to work with, but I think the only thing harder to hunt is snow geese, but cranes are definitely really tough. I would say the ducks and geese are playing checkers, but when you start hunting cranes, I think these cranes are playing chess. Nice, guys. Clint, I think. They're gonna work as good, but it, it seemed like they were, they were angled from too far out, like we're back into the sun. So what do you think the boys are gonna move the decoys a little bit? Caleb especially is a serial decoy mover. And, and as one of those people myself, you know, he constantly was tweaking the spread until we could finally get ourselves in a position where those cranes would come in, get their feet down, and we could get after them. What you do is you match the hatch. That's the 
rule of thumb, however they're standing in the field, you try to copy it with the decoys. And typically with cranes, it's big and wide and make sure they have enough gaps to land in because they come in and spread out. And also when they're in the field, it's not like when you see ducks on the water, you see ducks swimming, they make ripples, you see them stretching their wings, you see that white flash, which of course, you know, inspired all the robo duck type stuff. When they're standing in a field, they're almost motionless. Yep. It's not like you can attract them with motion either. Right. Yeah, they don't move. It's just something you don't get to see every day and you don't get to see it uh, but a couple of places across the country and man it's truly yeah, it's, special. It, it's amazing and you know I'm, of course anybody who's ever eaten these things I mean, if you're a if you're a fan of speckle belly geese <laughs> you're gonna like cranes that's They're right unbelievable ducks unlimited television is presented by drake waterfowl systems innovators in waterfowl hunting mossy oak shadow grass habitat the official camo of ducks unlimited browning firearms the best there is Native nurseries, hand-selected, hand-grown plants for wildlife. Higdon Outdoors, quality, customer service, innovation, that's Higdon. And Ducks Unlimited's 85th anniversary, celebrating 85 years as North America's leader in wetlands conservation. I would tell you, if I had to give you a memorable moment from crane hunting, Caleb had a really fast, wonderful yellow lab named Lennox, and to watch that dog work cranes is very different. I'm, I'm sure all of us that own retrieving dogs understand that the sole mission of those dogs is to get out there and get that bird in their mouth and get back. With dogs, a lot of people are real iffy on cranes because they're probably the meanest bird you can hunt. They'll definitely stand up and try to go for your dog's eyes. It's sort of like hunting a goose with a spear. They're just mad. A crippled crane is kind of a scary creature. You got big long wings. This dog would just charge out into that spread and essentially would hold that bird at bay until Caleb could come out uh, and get the bird properly dispatched. But my memorable moment is seeing that dog get out there and wrestle those cranes in the field. Really enjoyed hunting with Jim Nikolov. I mean, first of all, I want to thank Jim for his service. He's an Air Force veteran, spent a lot of time there. He's got a, he's got a very serious job and repairs helicopter motors for a living. So sort of puts a lot of what many of us do into uh, into perspective, doesn't it? So when I first met Jim Nikoloff, it was at a recruitment event in Albuquerque, and he was a true godsend. So being a younger face with some newer ideas and some newer uh, committee members, it was a lot easier for us to kind of come up with new ways to raise money for our local area and the conservation. Jim has really energized Ducks Unlimited in this area. He's put together banquets. He just, you know, put together a great clay shoot, some online auction. Here we go. We uh, kind of took a different take going away from the banquet during this, uh, the COVID times. Ended up raising $10,000 that day. So with the conservation work that we've done in New Mexico, benefits a lot of our species, not only elk and quail and turkey and mule deer. You know, water is so important down here and every little bit of piece of habitat really matters because if you lose one piece of habitat here, you know, you can lose the entire program. So the Artesia chapter is extremely special to me. It's one of the chapters that we just got started and it's a lot of thanks to, to Matt and Caleb Brewer. They were able to come in and really revive the chapter. So to see that camaraderie, getting out together as a team, not just for the outfitting company, but as volunteers for Ducks Unlimited. Uh, they're really taking charge together, not, you know, as, as a family. And that's something very important to kind of pass down to the next generations that other people see that. To be able to hunt with your son and to and just enjoy the, the time together, the camaraderie together, uh, work hard together, play hard together. I mean, we were out here all the time and it's just, you know, phenomenal. This weekend is a perfect example to bring the Albuquerque chapter together and the Artesia chapter. For those two groups to bond, nice, to spend guys. time in the field, and also spend time at our fundraising events is truly a special opportunity. When Ducks Unlimited was founded 85 years ago, membership was mostly from the northeastern part of the United States. Fast forward to today and DU chapters and members can be found in all 50 states. The West in particular is a growing region for wetlands conservation support. Utah, Idaho, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada are all states known more for big game hunting than waterfowling. 
And yet DU fundraising support from this region grows every year. Why, you ask? Well, that's a good question and one with an easy answer. Not all DU volunteers and supporters are waterfowl hunters, but plenty of people are passionate about wildlife conservation and clean water, all key components of the DU mission. These supporters commit their time and resources to wetlands conservation because it's good for their environment. And as we continue to expand our wetlands management work, we have people from all walks of life to thank in addition to the waterfowl hunting community. We greatly appreciate everyone who stands behind our vision of wetlands sufficient to fill the skies with waterfowl today, tomorrow, and forever. For more information on helping DU's wetlands conservation efforts, check out our website at ducks.org. DU Insights is brought to you by Mossy Oak Properties. Find your favorite place at mossyoakproperties.com. Hunting Sutton Hill Crane is an exciting experience, but it's going to take some preparation if you plan to use a retriever. You're talking about a big bird, a dangerous bird when he's wounded. But let's talk about some steps that you need to do, three steps, to prepare your dog for that Sand Hill Crane hunt. Number one, you need to think about eye protection. Number two, the body cavity protection. Number three, you need a steady dog. A dog that breaks on the shot, it's going to run into a really mad bird out there at some point. The defense of the wounded sandhill crane is going to be his beak. He's going to strike at that dog when he comes in for that retrieve. So let's look at what we're going to have to do for preparation. We have the goggles on the dog, but you need to have this dog in practice like we're going to do now with Mattis, getting used to these goggles. At first, he may not like them so much. So let's give it a try. We've got a retrieve set out. We line Mattis and he launches. Makes his pick, uses his nose and eyes. He can see clearly through these goggles and he returns back to his place. So here, practice makes perfect. He's used to the goggles, he's used to the vest, and now we can be ready for our first hunt. Steadiness, again, we want to practice keeping the dog very, very steady. Let's throw out a bumper and make it a denial. Tom's gonna to simply walk out there and get it himself. Every bird is not your dog's. So preparing for Sandhill Cranes, three steps, eye protection, body cavity protection, and steadiness. Duck Dog with Mike Stewart is presented by Purina Pro Plan, nutrition that performs. You know, this is a great part of the world, and I grew up here. I, I'm fortunate to work for Browning. Browning's located here. The Browning family came here, settled, started the business here. I can remember the first time I went to the marsh. And, and saw it and felt it and watched the ducks and the geese. And th that's why I love to be here at the Chesapeake Duck Club. It's, it's one of the oldest duck clubs there is in the area. And it's an honor for me to be a member. Chesapeake uh, Duck Club uh, history uh, started in 1903. And these clubs were formed after the end of the market hunting era. Yes. Um, but it was the railroad that brought them. That's right. The railroad was bringing people out here to come hunt. You know, they put the Golden Spike in 25 miles down the road from here. I mean, this area connected what then was industrial America to the emerging west. We're really fortunate here on the Great Salt Lake to have clubs like the Chesapeake, which exist at the end of these river systems right on the edge of the Great Salt Lake. Without their contribution, we would not have the quality habitat that we have right now. This is the habitat of Great Salt Lake marshes, it's the Sago Pond Reef. Yeah. But as duck food, that is just... Yeah, it is awesome. It doesn't really get any better because the birds eat the vegetation, they eat the tubers, and then in the spring, Sago has one of the most diverse and largest insect concentrations associated with it. And so they get all the protein in the spring. All the protein in the spring. Yeah. Uh, for ducklings, that's exactly what they're eating in the spring. It's just as good as you can get. No, I mean, anytime you see heavy sago like this, you expect to see canvasbacks and gadwalls. And there's one right there, as a matter of fact. The Great Salt Lake is really an oasis, literally in a desert Single. for waterfowl. They come from Canada, they come from Alaska, and we're sort of the pit stop here be before they hit California or, or even further south. Without this critical rest stop, you're going to see collapses at a continental scale of a variety of populations. This, this really is a critical place, and, and it's irreplaceable. 
for those of us who live east of the Mississippi, for us, water is just a convenience. I mean, we've always got it. We don't really ever think about it. And here it's really a commodity. Yeah, I mean, Mark, Mark Twain said it. It's whiskeys for drinking, water's for fighting over. We're the second driest state in the nation. We have huge demands on every drop of water. And then you compound that with the fact that we're the fastest Go. growing state in the country. So you've got all of these pressures colliding at the exact same time and the decision that we get to make is where where does that water go? Does it come here to the marsh? Does it come here to Great Salt Lake? Does it go to agriculture? Does it go to the cities? It's not wetlands at the expense of agriculture or waterfowl at the expense of growth. It's finding ways to combine both of those real needs. We need to be able to sit down at that farmer's table and say, yep, you've got 80% of the water that's coming into this Great Salt Lake. How can we find a balance between making you profitable on your farm and saving these critical wetlands just downstream. And the same with, with the cities. The reputation that DU has built is what's allowing it to be credible in a policy space on a heated topic like water. And, and you're going to see real tangible results because of our reputation. DU TV is powered by Browning Ammunition, the best there is, Biologic, scientifically proven wildlife products. Purina Pro Plan, nutrition that performs. Tetra Hearing, more than hearing protection, it's hearing perfection. Mossy Oak Properties, America's land specialist. Closed captioning for Ducks Unlimited Television is brought to you by Mossy Oak Bottomland, the official timber pattern of Ducks Unlimited. If you've been around duck hunting any length of time, you know exactly what this stuff is. You see it on boat blinds, you see it on permanent blinds. It's these knotted palm sheets that go by a you know, variety of different brand names, but it's all the same stuff, which is palm leaves knotted so that when you cut them apart or fold them, they don't unravel. The trouble with these is because it's natural palm, it will rot over time. The cycle of wet and dry is not a great thing for them. I think that one of the most important things you can do with them is if, you, if you've got a place, a nice boathouse like this, or just your basement, you know, get them home, lay them out, and get them dried out when you're done using them. The other thing I like to do with them that makes them last is use some deck sealer. Go to a big box store, buy a couple of gallons of the cheapest deck sealer you can buy. If you have a choice, you want to go with matte as opposed to a gloss. Lay them out in your driveway, put, them in, put that stuff in a pump sprayer, Soak them down really good with that stuff, let them dry in the sun, and that'll put a waterproof coating on them. And they'll usually last another year or so. They'll last a little bit longer, but that's your tip for today. Ducks Unlimited's Guns and Gear is brought to you by Tetra Hearing. Built for hunters by hunters. Calls, wings, or triggers. Hear the hunt like never before. As we look at the way duck hunting looks today with semi-automatic guns and high-tech waders and short shaft mud motors. I love to come and sort of feel like the walls could talk to me in these historic clubs because think about this club has been hunted since the days when you know a sophisticated gun was a hammerless side-by-side. -side. The decoys were wooden and they might have had three, six, nine of them. I mean, it was a simpler time, certainly. Well, you know, our company has a really rich history. John Browning is kind of known as probably the greatest gun inventor that ever lived. So John Browning invented the first auto loader shotgun, which was the A5, and he used to come out to the marsh and shoot ducks. Their waterfowl guns are icons. You know, the original Auto 5 was probably the most iconic shotgun ever. I always tell people we're not selling product, we're selling heartbeats. And Browning product, if you use it right, you have a good time, you're gonna have those heartbeats. And their guns currently, that you know, the new version of the Auto 5, the Maxxis, you know, those are phenomenal products and, and technically really sound tools for a dedicated waterfowler to use. You know, we've been very thankful to have Browning involved with Ducks Unlimited and very thankful for everything that they've done for conservation, both here in Utah and, and nationally as well. Hunters are the conservationists. I mean, without hunters, we wouldn't have the game populations that we have today. We wouldn't have the waterfowl we have today. Hunters, by and large, put their money where their mouths are. They pay for the things they do 
the federal duck stamp. I mean, 98% of that money goes into the ground. I mean, we put a lot of time. We, the membership spends hundreds of hours every year improving habitat, nesting boxes, all of the things that make for more waterfowl. And it's not just duck habitat, it's, yeah. it's eagle habitat. It's, it's pelican it's, habitat. We are lucky enough to be out in the middle of the marsh, but we provide this public benefit of having open space and clean water and wildlife habitat that the rest of the population gets to enjoy too. 32 years has gone fast and what this duck club means to me, I have a, a love and a passion uh, for the history that it has. I've had grandchildren grow up here from uh, all of them shooting their first duck. They all love to hunt. My kids were raised right here at the Chesapeake Duck Club. If you want to see our sport and heritage continuing, we need you. You need to step up. And there's no other organization that's making the types of investments that we are. If you get somebody in the woods or the marsh, they are hooked for life. We've got to continue to look for ways to bring more and more people. We've got to get kids out from out in front of the TV and the computer and get them in the woods in the marsh. This episode proves that you can't judge a book by its cover. What seems to be dry country supports thousands of waterfowl. Thanks again to all the DU volunteers in New Mexico and around the country for making wetlands conservation a reality. Also, a special thanks to Carol Dawson and the Chesapeake Club members for hosting DU TV. Your support of Ducks Unlimited keeps waterfowl in the skies and habitat on the ground throughout North America. See you next time on DU TV. Vegas and the craps table. No more bets. The, the croupier says lucky seven. <laughs> Home, James.